Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Underwater Photography 101, presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Fernando Lessa. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you so much for being here today. Over to you, Fernando. Awesome, thanks so much, Rob. And uh, thanks everyone for joining today. And um, yeah, I'll be talking about uh, underwater photography and all the things related to taking pictures, you know, in this kind of dynamic environment. So uh, I'm a full-time natural history documentarist and a part-time expedition leader with NATHAM. So I spend a lot of time in the field uh, documenting animals and behaviors and ecosystems. And I have a personal um, preference for uh, underwater work. So I've been doing, uh, I'm a document, I'm an underwater documentary since 2011, and I regularly spend over 120 hours a year underwater, which means it's, it's quite a lot of time and, uh, you know, a lot of time talking to fish and I just enjoy every moment. It's, it's an amazing job. So I get a lot of people asking me how these amazing pictures are, are made. Uh, I'm known of this uh, beautiful uh, National Geographic covers are mine, but you know, it, it gives a, I think this one gives a kind of <clears throat> shows a variety of possibilities that you can have underwater. And it's always the same, like, how do you do this, right? How, how you get so close to the seals, you know, in, in the water with sharks, you know, macros of anemones or even diving in the icebergs. But for, for me to be able to, to explain how this happened, the first thing we have to understand is how light behaves underwater. So we use, of course, underwater cameras, but the end is capturing the light that is available. And how does that happen? So um, I'll be talking a little bit about the evolution of this amazing gear that we use. So. Um, we start uh, with this one here on the left. So basically it was a very rudimentary box that would hold a whole camera inside. And that's the gear that, used, that was used like early, early 1900s. Um, but the big development in underwater photography came with the invention of uh, the Nikon's camera, which was the very first camera that it was waterproof, so it did not have to be in a house. So it was a very compact gear, you know, you could exchange the lens and it was very, very reliable. So there was a, a big uh, improvement for underwater photography. And later on, uh, nowadays, you know, 99.9% .9 of the underwater photographers use uh, digital cameras and those cameras are inside a house. And here on the right, you, you can, have an idea of how complex these houses are because basically you have to have access to all the options and all the buttons and, and every uh, setting on the camera. So they're, they're pretty complex uh, piece of gear. So how the light behaves in the water and how can we use those beautiful piece of gear to document it? So the sunlight enters in the water column and you can trace water up to uh, light rays uh, up to a thousand meters deep, but our eyes can barely see um, any significant um, light after six meters, 60 meters, sorry. And there's almost, uh, you know, the amount of light that, that penetrates past 200 meters is insignificant. So for us and water photographers, we very, uh, we have to, to be shallow, right? If you wanna use the, the light available, or otherwise you have to bring some other light sources. So this is a graph that I think gives it, ex, uh, explains very well how light behaves. So once water, the, sorry, once the light penetrates the water, it diffracts. So the white light is a combination of different colors of light. So we have a red, green, uh, red, yellow, green, blue. And, those uh, length of lights are filtered by the water column in different ways. So uh, the first light, that, like the one that can penetrate the least, is the red light, the red spectrum. So after five meters, there's almost no red light. So that's why when you get your 
uh, cell phone and take it for and go dive in it, or maybe your GoPro. All the picture, all the colors you see most of the time are green and red, because the the red and the yellow light are filtered almost instantly. Right past three meters of water, you have almost no reds. Uh, five meters, you have almost no yellows, and then it goes on. After 30 meters, if you take a picture with no uh, significant light source, it's everything is going to be in in hues of blue because that's the bond, that's the length that can penetrate the water column. So if you want to have bright, full, and colorful pictures, either you have to be very shallow or you have to have a light source combined with your camera. So as, as I mentioned, you know, uh, light doesn't go very deep, but sometimes fish are deeper than that. So how do you do? How can you combine? How can you work without natural light? And I think this picture is a, is a good example. So <clears throat> you see uh, in front of the pictures, you can see the, the herring school all bright and very shiny. So that's where my light is bright. It's lighting up the fish because I'm using underwater flashes. And you can see the rest of the fish at the end where my flesh can reach. And you see that's kind of green. So that's kind of show a little bit. If I take in this picture with no flash, it will be all green. You know, as you see in the back, and since I'm using the flash, you can see the bright fish right in, in the front part of the picture. So for that, combining with our under our houses, you have to have a flash. Um, there's uh, some people that use uh, torches, constant light, but unfortunately for photography, they're not very good. They are the best options for um, video, <clears throat> but not for photography. Because for photography, you need a lot of light for a very short period of time and flashes are, are the tool. And you can see in this picture here, that this is not my picture, but you can see a photographer with a camera in a housing and using two flashes. It's kind of the standard lighting for underwater work nowadays. So once you understand where the light is and how to capture that, you also have to be very mindful about the environment that we work on. So it's not just a matter get in the water, seeing a beautiful scene and just go for it. You have to access where you are and be very, very respectful with the uh, wildlife that you find there. And also be very mindful to cause the least stress to the animals. So for example, when I am working something that I always consider as how much stress and I'm causing to the animals compare to the benefits I can uh, bring to that area that I'm working. So for example, if I know it's an area that's very sensitive, but it's never been documented, and I'm aware that documentation is gonna be helpful in protecting that area, for me, that's, you know, that kind of work. So I'm gonna be stressing the animals a little bit, but I'm gonna be helping protecting that area. What I really try to avoid is, you know, stressing animals and stressing everything in the environment for, for no reason, and, and that's something to be very mindful. So once you understand how the light behaves on the water, how to take a picture, and you are mindful about the environment, then you have then it's time to start then it's time to start thinking about diving. Because basically to work on the water, the photography part has to be very uh, too, that you, you, have, you, very, you have to be very confident with your gear. Because when you're underwater, you have all the complexity. You have uh, taking a picture on land plus being underwater, which sometimes can be pretty tricky. So which are the diving skills that you need to have to be a photographer? So you have to be a very good diver. And on top of that, there's a lot of, you know, things that you have to be aware. Of. So you have to create a connection to your ear that you know where every, where all the settings of the camera is, are, sorry. And you also want to be very confident on underwater, on, on diving. So I recommend people, you know, at least one or two years diving experience, you know, diving in many different situations. Um, and knowing your, your diving gear very, very closely. 
and also on your water, uh, sorry, and also your photography gear. So, you know, you have to be very familiar with your camera, you have to be very familiar with your housing, and then you put all the two together. And once you have all the gear, buoyancy is the most important skill for underwater photographers because if you if you photograph in a sensitive coral for example you don't want to touch it by no means you know you really want to be careful to protect that and not causing any stress so you have to be a very confident diver and also um i just bringing up some uh, fun facts about underwater uh sorry i put underwater i just mistake underwater photography so you know it's a lot to be to be on top of or just a lot of skills that you have to be confident on and a lot of small details and there's a lot of stuff that can, can go wrong so for example every underwater photographer at least once in their life will forget the landscape on the camera and you know that's that's a pretty bad thing because usually you realize when you jump in the water you turn your camera on and everything is wet and then you realize oh landscape is on or even memory cards so there is a very common saying that you know a lot of photographers happen to do at least once also uh, when you're diving when you uh we breathe usually uh we, we are in a scuba tank so we breathe in air air a big portion of the air is actually nitrogen and when you were uh, deep so anything past uh, 45 uh, feet or 50 meters a little bit more nitrogen can becomes a narcotic air so when you dive in, you have the issue of narcosis which is basically you get intoxicated by the nitrogen of the air you're breathing and that intoxication makes you feel almost like drunk so Imagine with a camera, oh, it has a lot of settings and all options. Then you dive in. So you have to be mindful about the environment, about your air, about where you are. And on top of that, you're feeling a little bit drunk, which is a very common thing. And, you know, there's no way around. If you go deep breathing air, you're going to have it. If you go shallow, you don't feel it. So, you know, that just adds one layer of complexity of the thing and if you ever seen pictures of people you know taking pictures deep or filming deep in deep waters you know big respect because they're probably narked and it's very very hard to work on those conditions and you know as i said photography is easy diving is no big deal but putting the two together is very hard but we get there you know just cracks a lot So now the fun part, and so what is my, what is being, what is like being an underwater photographer? So a lot of my work is collaborating with scientists and media and uh, shining light into stories and issues that most people are not aware. So um, since the beginning of my career, I've been interested in, you know, those environment, those ecosystems and those animals that not people, you know, care much or, you know, sometimes they're not those super colorful stuff. So I'm always interested in those stuff that nobody seems to care much. And that's, you know, kind of my motto. I, I got to bring and show people the beauty of the thing that sometimes is, is hard to see it. So here are some, um, some stories that I work and that shows a little bit of variety of my everyday. So it can be from a photograph still had it's a type of salmon in a in a river and that's a very dangerous fish um i could also be working like right in the city for example here uh in this article on the left so false creek uh that's an urban area here in vancouver that you know was considered like that for a really long time but now we're seeing life uh, coming back and i've been collaborating with a couple of scientists and documenting that area or also documenting salmon in, in some um, cold water stream. So it's always different stories and every day is a new challenge. And as I said, my motto, like if I want people to care, I need to take them to the places and have that uh, care about. So I need to come back with 
good images that shows the beauty and then people say okay that's really nice that should be uh, conserved you know I, I feel that sometimes just with words is very hard uh, we are a visual animal so I think photography is the best tool to you know make people care or start a conversation about you know conserving and taking care of places so Sometimes um, I work with scientists, you know, I do a lot of conservation work. And this is one of the, the very first pictures I, I've taken. So it's just the uh, scientists, they were assembling uh, salmon to estimate the salmon population in a stream. And sometimes they get different animals. So here they, they get a salamander and they just release and then, and this kind of work is very meaningful for me because you're not just showing some sensitive environment, but you're also showing the work behind to keep those places, uh, you know, to keep life and keep preserving those places. So for me, this was when a was a very important picture. And sometimes bringing, you know, a set shining light in some really low species. So uh, this was a very interesting uh, assignment for me. So uh, here in the metro of Vancouver, we have the Nooksack days, which is one of the many endangered species found in, uh, in urban water. But this guy, he has one layer on top of that, because it's not just an uh, endangered species, this is very threatened. So there's estimate of the population of this fish is less than 10,000 uh, fish. So the Nooksack, they're, they're closely related to carbs, and they only find in, in, found in three streams in the Pacific Northwest. So in Canada, we have two of those streams and one in Washington. And the coincidence, these guys are fine in the Brunette River, which is a river that cross one of the big, the most populated areas in Metro Vancouver. So um, how can you have such an endangered fish in the city? And most people were not aware so long story short, there's some projects uh, for development in this river. And I was approached by a, a nonprofit that say, oh, you know, we have fish in the river, nobody knows, nobody's seen, it's never been photographed before. And we'd like to run this campaign and you know, show this people, show people that we have this fish here. So for me, it was a big challenge. Uh, this is a very small fish, you know, two, three inches. Uh, I never seen it, there were no pictures I could I didn't even know how the fish looked like. And it was really interesting finding it, documenting it, understanding how it behaves so we could get a, a better picture. And then having a nice picture, which was the very first uh, time that this fish was photographed in the river. So this was very important. And in the end, the, they managed to, to get some support for the cause. And now the river, it has some sort of protection. So at least the, the population of this fish is thriving. And also, this is uh, another really cool assignment. So these are the mini humps. So this is a type of sockeye. So uh, one of species of Pacific salmon. And these are landlocked fish. So it's a population of sockeye that doesn't, like uh, salmon are anadromous fish, which means they spend a part of their life in fresh water and a part of their life in the ocean. But these guys, they are born in a lake. So it's a very different type of population than they spend their whole life cycle in the lake. Um, and it's a very small population, around 2,000 fish. They've never been photographed before. Uh, you, you, you type the name on, on Google, nothing would show up. Not even uh, the F Department of Fishers of Canada had a picture of these guys. So again, it was approached by a nonprofit say, you want to start studying this fish, you want to run a conservation campaign, but we, we don't even have a draw. And it was really nice connecting to scientists and doing a lot of research to see what would be the best timing and how to find this fish. And yeah, in the end, we managed to, to get a couple pictures and this is a picture that, that has been used to, to promote conservation of this fish. And again, for me, it was, a, it, was a, it was a very special moment seeing, you know, now that there is a picture, people can 
they people know what we're talking about and they say, okay, I understand what you're talking. It's a it's a very different salmon. You'd never say this is a salmon. And you know, having this protection throughout photography, it's it's I think for me is the most uh, meaningful way to use underwater documentation. And sometimes it's, a, it's about finding lost fish in population. So this was an important picture. This was taken here uh, in, a, in the South British Columbia border. So these are um, Chinook salmon uh, in the US, we call it kings. So these are the largest uh, Pacific salmon species. And this is exactly population is very important because this is the population that is the most important food source for the resident orca whales. So I'm not sure if you guys heard in the media, but the, the resident orca population close to Metro Vancouver is very endangered. The numbers are going down and down because the whales are not having access to ride this population. So the fish, they come, they're early runners. They come slightly earlier than most of Chinook. And that's where the, and the orcas used to wait for these guys. And since the population is in decline, uh, there's less food, so the orcas are suffering. And when I was approached by some scientists, um, they didn't even know how many how many of those fish were returning. They barely know the timing of their returning. So there's very little information. And it was a lot of like a lot of time spending underwater, a lot of days and a lot of research, you know, just being in the water and waiting for the fish until one day they came. And uh, for me it was it was amazing seeing like this fish are, you know, kind of meter, meter and a half uh, long, like three feet or more. And seeing them going upstream to reach their spawning grounds and being able to get a picture and say, you know, this is the fish. These are the guys we have to preserve. For me, it was, you know, it's something that is just priceless. And sometimes it's about you know, documenting fish that are not very hard, but very rare, but it's just fish that people don't get to see. So here uh, in uh, in South BC, we have the Western Brook lamprey, which is a fish that most people are familiar. You know, most people have seen the lamprey here and there, but there are some people that work with in the salmon stream, they spend a year without seeing one because most of the time they're like in the gravel, when they walk like under rocks and, and sticks and kind of fight, and it's very, very hard to see them. But the fish, they have very curious spawning uh, behavior. So for one day in the near, usually in April, May, when you have a combination of perfect water, uh, uh, volume of water, so rain and the temperature, all this out of the sediment. And they they get together and they create almost like a big black ball. And, and that's their spawning behavior. So imagine like a uh, like a small mountain stream that for a day it gets absolutely black core with this tiny lampreys. And that's an event that is never been it was never documented uh, in, in South DC before. Um, and you know, you, you're talking to a lot of fish people who said, never heard. And I had the chance to document that really cool moment. And it was the first time. And again, that they also adds, helps to add the layer of protection to the streams, because even if there's no, um, let's say, law that will protect the river more for, for lampreys, because it's not considered endangered fish here, you know, it adds, a degree because when people walk by that that stream and they see a picture or maybe they, they heard about that they say, oh this is the river that gets all those lampreys and get all black with fish so it's always like on the back of their minds it helps to add a layer of protection and there's so many other cool stuff that people don't get to see that you know you only see when you're underwater so this is uh, the inside it's a picture inside of uh, salamander egg mass. So salamanders, when they lay their eggs, they make like a big uh, jelly ball where the eggs are inside and, and that stays underwater. So this is a picture of the inside of that egg mass. So I was diving with my camera 
in our regular housing. And then we have like a probe lens, which is almost like an endoscope. So it's a very thin and long lens that lets you get very, very close. So this picture was taken underwater and you can see so all the egg mass on the back. And if you look in details, you can see each, each cell that's inside of this egg, which is, uh, it's really, uh, you know, it's a very unique perspective. Or also freshwater sponges, which is a very common animal. Uh, they're, they're found in most, most water systems in North America, but a lot of people don't know. You know, they go to the Caribbean, they go to the Red Sea, and they see corals and sponges, and they are very familiar with that. But when you tell them, oh, there's freshwater sponges, people, really? And say, yeah, and they're bright green. And people, they never seen it. So, yeah, it's, a, it's really cool to show some animals. And you can see here on the right, you have some details, and you can see very much where the water gets in. So it, the sponges filtrate that water and take the, their food source from the water. And, you know, a, a tiny sponge, like this one in, in the picture, which is maybe, let's say, five inches, that thing can filtrate an Olympic uh, pool of water in a day. So these are like water pumps, they're filtering water nonstop. And most people are not aware. And also, I sometimes I found other stories. So I, I'm a fisherman myself. I've been fishing my whole life, and I'm super interested in traditional fishing techniques. So this is another story I, I did back home in Brazil of the traditional fishing communities. And, you know, it is very special document because these are the most eco-friendly uh, techniques available, you know. So basically, they only catch the species they need just in the number that we even need. And, you know, it really helps just to, you know, keep those communities uh, around and fishing and still preserve the ecosystem because they use very uh, eco-friendly techniques. And for me, this was a, a really good story. And again, very little information. You got to really go for it and spend time underwater until you, you, you've seen this really cool scenes uh, pass in front of you. So I'd like to share some of the other projects that I worked on and that are very special for me. So um, I'm originally from Brazil, and uh, when I was still living there a couple of years ago, I did the first uh, documentation of the underwater Atlantic rainforest. So like here that you have the temperate or cold rainforest, uh, in, in South America, we have the warm rainforest. So we used to have this beautiful forest that will cover all our uh, Atlantic coast, so basically the, the east coast of Brazil. And this forest would go from north all the way to the very south. Uh, unfortunately, that area is the most populated area in Brazil. So of course the forest, you know, is being densely logged and farmed and etc. So just a couple of spots of the forest are still standing. But still, that's the, the kind of forest that you find the most number of species for uh, um, kilometer square, square kilometer. So the the amount of, of life and the variety of life is, is just off the charts. For example, the Atlantic rainforest is way, way richer than the Amazon forest, which is the, the most famous rainforest. And the Atlantic forest has never been documented underwater before. So when I had the chance to collaborate with a couple of scientists, it was the first time that someone got in those waters with a camera. So we have absolutely no clue what we've been seeing. And we find some really cool animals that i like to show you. So um, this is a kind of uh, the streams um, you're documenting. So it, in a way or another, they're similar to the, to the streams you find in the temperate forest. So you know, a lot of gravel, a little bit of sand, all the riparian vegetation. And the water here is not even super warm. So, you know, 15, 16 uh, Celsius, which is, you know, not very, uh, not very cold for our standards, but definitely cold for, for South American standards. And uh, this project we started photographing in the mountains of Rio de Janeiro. So um, 
then that was very close to the time that we had the World Cup. And the first fish we photographed was this knife fish, which is an electric, it's a, it's a type of electric eel. So these guys are maybe two or three inches, they're very small. And uh, we have no clue that they were there. Usually you, you find them in wetlands and stuff, and you're very surprised to find them in, in mountain streams close to the coast. And these are some other animals. So in South America, we have a very uh, rich uh, fauna of uh, crabs and prawns in fresh water, just because back in time, a lot of those areas that they are found nowadays used to be the ocean. So we have a, a very uh, rich fauna in a, a series of prawns and crabs. And I like this guy here because it has this sort of kind of blue kind of tone and all this shiny glitter on that. So it's a beautiful animal. And here on the right, uh, it's a species, uh, it's from the, um, it's a family of fish, it's called Brickham. Uh, we don't have them in North America. So we are very lucky because once we find this species, this is a very threatened species in Brazil, it's probably one of the most threatened species in, in the whole country. When we, are, we find that fish in that stream, which we're not expecting, we are able to, you know, bring it up to the authorities and we use very much this picture and say, hey guys, we have this fish in this river. And we also have a picture of the fish swimming in the river. And because of that, you know, we used as, as a proof, as a, a scientific evidence, um, we were able to really protect that area and turn that stream in a, in a, in a like a national park. So nowadays, just because we were able to use a picture is a proof that that fish was there. We, we protect that, that the whole watershed entirely. So, and nowadays that's one of the very few places where you actually can find those fish. And some more uh, shots of that same area. So you see like kind of prom and all the glitter. It's just beautiful. And this is a, another cool animal that you can only find in that area. So. It's, it's from a group, it's called Eglida. So it's, a, it's in the evolution, is in between a lobster and a crab. So it has characteristics of a crab and it's, it's very much in between. Imagine it's like a crab, sorry, it's, it's like a, a lot, looks like a lobster without the tail. And they only find in fresh water, they only find in that area in South America and they're very, very sensitive. So any disturbance in the water quality, those fish, those animals are the first ones to disappear. So being able to document those animals in that area, it was very, very uh, important to show that that area is still very conserved and it still hold good um, water parameters. And um, fun fact, this picture was taken with a slide. So I used the Nikon 5, so that orange camera I showed there in the beginning. And again, it was the first time that this animal was photographed, uh, photographed underwater. And uh, this is another cool project that I'm, uh, I'm working. This is still a work in progress. So I'm in charge of documenting the underwater life in False Creek. So False Creek, as you can see in this picture, is right in the center of Vancouver. It's a small bay. And back in time, uh, this was to be Vancouver's main port. So a lot of disturbance in the environment, you know, a lot of pollution um, back in time. But slowly, um, authorities have been working and, you know, improving the, the, the area and, and trying to clean up slowly. So we started to see life coming back. And for me, it was very important to show that there is life there. So then people would care, you know, if someone was walking by the water instead of Know, and they just want to throw some garbage in the water. You know, if they see a picture of some nice wildlife there, they might think twice. So for me, it is like a, you know, I, I took to the heart to show that this area is still alive. And uh, everything started with this guy. So it's a kind of uh, a crab and you, you can see it's, uh, it's climbing on top of a, a can of pop. And you know, having the red of the can pop and, and having all the score of the crab for me was really cool. And actually this picture nowadays is being printed and 
is in the shore. So it's really helping showing people that there is life there. And um, this is another one. So this is a dogfish, which is a type of shark. And I work very close uh, with the media. And uh, once we find, we didn't know that uh, dogfish would be found in, in the Vancouver waters, in the Vancouver urban waters. So when we took this fish, uh, we talked to the journalists and sent this picture to all the major uh, news. And they actually got the cover to different uh, news outlets saying there are sharks in, in Vancouver, which from one side, you know, maybe make people think, oh my goodness, there's a shark here, blah, blah, blah. And they may be afraid, but these guys are absolutely harmless. They're, they're smaller, like they're like a feet, feet and a half long fish. So there's no dangers whatsoever. But that early media was very important because, you know, that kind of connect people in a way to say, oh, there are sharks there, there's life. You know, those sharks must be eating something. So it, it, it really shows that the area was alive and in getting, like a cover in, a, in the major uh, Vancouver news, telling people there's life in Falls Creek. There is like absolutely our goal, you know, show people there is life so people can start uh, caring. And uh, fun fact, it's not just about sharks. Like if you can see the number of crabs, so I've never seen such a density of crabs anywhere else in my life. So the whole bottle of the area is covering crabs because you can't fish. so. And there's, of course, there's a lot of food. So it's, it's beautiful seeing like so much life all together right in the, in the heart of the city. So these are some, some more pictures. So these are um, sticklebacks, which is a really cool fish. They form this very large schools and they're very dense and they all move together. So very scenic um, fish and you can see you're right in the surface with a with a boat on the back. So again, it was a, a very impactful fish. Uh, sorry, impactful picture to show people. You know, there is life. And uh, here's some uh, plumos anemones, which is a, again, it's a very common species in the Pacific Northwest. But most of people, uh, if you're not a diver, they're not very familiar with it. And finding those guys right in the heart of the city, and you can see these ones are growing like on an old pipe. So, you know, it was a uh, it was very interesting. And uh, this is another project that uh, I'm, I'm still working on. So it's called the Heart of the Fraser. It became uh, a book and later became a documentary. So. The heart of the Fraser is this area in between the city of Hope and the city of Chilliwack and the Fraser River. And as you can see, the picture is just a massive uh, gravel bar. So a lot of islands and a lot of gravel. And this is a, a very important hotspot. So hotspots are areas that had a, like more than expected uh, number of species together. And these are the most important spawning grounds for the white sturgeon in the entire British Columbia. So um, I work with different, uh, with different groups in, in, in shining the light of the importance of this area because you know, a lot of people would walk and just think, oh, this is just gravel, there's nothing here. So the Fraser River is a kind of murky river so you can see what's in the water and people would see the gravel and think, what's in there? You couldn't see it, right? They couldn't see that underwater reality. So working this project was very nice. Um, I had the chance to spend lots of hours in the water documenting a white sturgeon, which is the first time that this fish was photographed in the river. And you can see this guy here in the picture. This guy is around three meter long, so nine feet. Uh, and it's not even an adult, it's still considered a juvenile. Uh, this fish can start to can reach five meters or 15 feet. So, and they can live 100, 150 years. So, you know, finding this fish and documenting and, and showing people like, this is the white sturgeon, this fish can be found here, and this is where they spawn. It was really interesting. So, with sturgeon, of course, you have a lot of salmon, and that's the reason why the sturgeon there, because they feed on the, uh, in the eggs that the salmon lay in the fall. So, here is very much you see this is a, as a male chum salmon and you can see underneath kind of there's kind of depression so 
that's where they lay the axe. And that's where you get the sturgeon moving around with your feet on the axe. So it's a very cool area. And it was very, very nice to, you know, show people what life is in there and why it has to be preserved. And some more pictures. So this is a, a split shot. And you can see this is a, is a bear that just walked by. So it is a very Pacific Northwest area. So lots of vegetation, a lot of salmon in the fall, and of course, a lot of bears as well. So here is a pink salmon uh, just laying its eggs uh, in the ground. And you can see here, it's a, it's a very colorful image. So it's a very shallow, again, it's, it's less than a meter, you know, two, three feet deep. So that's why you still get all the, the color, like the, the light can penetrate and still you, you get colorful images without the need of having to use uh, flashes. And uh, this is another uh, cool project that I'm working on and I'm gonna work on. So it later became a book and a, docu uh, and a documentary, which is available. Uh, if you guys wanna watch it on YouTube, just type Urban Summer. It's a 12 minute uh, uh, long documentary, really good for, for families and kids. So uh, the Urban Salmon was the first uh, underwater documentation of someone in, in an urban environment. So when I moved to Vancouver eight years ago, I saw this picture that says someone in habitat. And I was very puzzled, like, how is this possible? Do you really get someone in the city? No way, right? It, it is something that for me, coming from South America, like, there's no, no way. But it's actually true. Uh, so we have all 50 um, urban streams that has a salmon population that you actually can find salmon in Vancouver. And this project was all about it, documenting those streams and, and telling people, we have salmon in their backyard. So, you know, they could care and protect the area. So it was a two year long project, very interesting, you know, documenting this, the fish and showing that they live in their backyard. And, you know, they're very important. They're a keystone fish. So some pictures I've seen. So uh, this was actually the very, 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 uh, very, very first uh, child, uh, salmon ever. So it was photographed in Burnaby, in, which is Metro Vancouver. And this guy is really big. So it was like, nine, it was like maybe eight kilos, like 20 pounder, so pretty big fish. And it was swimming in the stream, which is so shallow. It, there's not even in, enough water to cover it, you know, and it just keep going up. And I remember um, taking the bus to, to, to go to that uh, stream like 6 a.m. very early in the morning, you know, and my expectation was like, there's no way, there's no way there's, there's someone in the stream. And then boom, I get there and I see this beautiful fish. And for me, there was like a, a life moment, you know, just like people have to know this, they have to see this, this is really special. So um, I just, start you know looking for more uh, salmon streams and more and more picture and documenting the whole life cycle of salmon in the urban stream. So these are uh, juvenile coho salmon. So this fish is spent up to two, uh, two, two years in fresh water before migrating uh, out to the ocean. And this is a huge um, school of coho salmon that's in, a, in the Capilano River in, in North Vancouver. So this is a big uh, pool where uh, we get like a very early run. So this fish usually come and get in the river in May and they stay up to three months there just getting adapted until they are ready to spawn. And for me, it was uh, it's a very interesting river to document because uh, a lot of the, most of the water from Vancouver, it, it came from a dam. So it's the Capilano Dam. So this river was dam and that basically wipe out the whole salmon for the from the river. There's just absolutely no spawning ground. So in order to overcome that, they create they create a hatchery, which as a conservationist is you know it's a kind of it's not the best way to to fix the river to fix the problem, but it creates this population of fish that people can actually go there and catch a fish. So you know 
as a conservationist, I don't like the hatchery, but I really like the idea of having an urban stream that people can actually go spend time in the wilderness and, and, and catch a fish. And that kind of protects other rivers. So just if people can stay close to the city, they may not drive far away and reach other like more sensitive areas. So it's a, it's a very important river for me and, and seeing this beautiful school there was really cool. Um, and this is a is a pink salmon. Again, salmon usually you find them in very shallow water, so that's why you still can get all these colorful images without the, the need of uh, having flashes. And this is a coho salmon, so it's a male, and it start. It's it's not like fully showing um, the spawn feature, so it's going to get bright red and black. So really cool fish. And the juveniles in the spring as well. So um, to wrap up, I'd like to to share this uh, quote from a very famous photographer called Paul Nicholson. That and he said that when I'm underwater, I'm the only chance in connecting the world with this underwater reality. And that's throughout the visions I come back with. So my feeling is that. I have this obligation of coming back with beautiful pictures to show people how amazing it is this underwater reality or this underwater helm that, you know, if you're not a diver, you just don't have access to it. So that's, you know, I think that's the most important thing for an underwater photographer. You have the chance to document things that nobody has the chance to do it. So. That's why I really think it's, it's a very important, it's a very important job, and we have a very important role in protecting this, you know, ecosystems that are so hard to see it. And uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Fernando. Now, before we start in with some questions, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. All right, let's get to some of these questions. Um, so are there any differences when photographing in salt water as opposed to fresh water? Um, no, not really. There is a little bit of difference when you're diving in fresh water when you, when, or in the ocean. So just because of the density of the water, but uh, no, there's a, it's, it's not a huge difference. Um, I would say maybe, um, since uh, fresh water is not, it doesn't have the influence of tides, I would say it's more common to have good visibility, which is very important for underwater photography in fresh water than in the ocean. But in, in terms of practical difference, I, I would say it is very much the same. So is there a camera that you would recommend for a snorkeler as opposed to a diver? Is there a better uh, camera for each use? Well, there's not a there's not a better camera. The best camera is the one that's available. So, if you're going underwater, the best camera you can have is the one that is accessible. Um, I would say, if you just stay shallow, if you're not going deep, if you're just like snorkeling, I would say the GoPros nowadays, especially the latest models, they do a beautiful job, and you can get really nice pictures. Um, a good accessory to have is having like a red or a pink filter because that will add the wavelength that are absorbed by water. So you can go a little bit deeper and still get very colorful pictures if you're using those filters because they're just bringing up the color that was lost in the water column. So I wouldn't say there's a, a, a better camera, but usually I try if I'm snorkeling, I try to go with less gear. Just, you know, you don't have a lot of time on the water, so you want something that just works. So I highly recommend a GoPros if you're snorkeling. So do you do an, uh, a lot of post-processing uh, for your underwater photos? Um, well, there's a lot of ethics behind that, you know, especially if you're submitting your pictures to a publication and competition. So I, I, I really try to use the list. Um, needed so basically 
a little bit of contrast, a little bit of saturation, maybe brighten up a little bit or darken up a little bit. But uh, in, in underwater, you, you, you find a lot of particles. And those particles, especially when using flash, depends on the angle that you use the flash, they, they can show up in the pictures you know, quite a lot. So depends on the situation, if the, the visibility is not good, if there's a lot of sediment, sometimes you have to, you know, in post-production, you know, go and take those, how we call those, that's backscatter. So sometimes you end up needing a little, little bit of post-production, but I'll say I, for my work, I, I basically try to do level contrast and saturation and a little bit of sharpening. Great, thank you so much. So, does shining lights underwater have a negative impact on the wildlife underneath? That's a, that's a very important question, and it's a very controversial topic. Um, I don't think there is a consensus saying if it, it, it impacts the animal, but I would say the, the diver, have, being a diver, having a diver in the water, of course, that will cause some stress to the animals. You know, you 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 with a big gear, you you're a big animal, so you could be a predator, and then you make noise like with the bubbles and everything. So, I assume that every time you wander water with wildlife, you are causing some sort of stress, more or less. You impacting them in a way. So I try to be very mindful how long I spend in each area, how long I spend which animal. And for a fish, you don't see a lot like you react into flash because it's so fast, you know, it's just a fraction of a second. So I don't really see fishing reacting to the flash, but, you know, just to be safe, I assume, it, I assume that you are causing some stress. Um, in order to accept, that kind of stress, you know, technology is developing. So nowadays, a lot of photographers, including myself, we're using rebreathers. So it's a it's a diving gear that basically filters your air. So you don't release bubbles as you breathe. And I believe that bubbles are the most stressful thing, especially for fish. So not having those bubbles, you're just much quieter. So you know, I, I assume that's less stressful for fish. So yeah, I think every time you're underwater, you, you're stressing it. So you gotta be mindful. Great, thank you for addressing that. So how deep are the freshwater sponges found? Oh, very shallow, very shallow. You can find them an inch of water. So I highly recommend if you, if you live close by to any stream, you know, just go there with your mask, especially, you know, when you have a big rain, just give one or two days for that kind of sediment to be, to clean kind of the bottle and just go look for them. They're, especially in North America, they're most bright green, very easy to find and very shallow, very shallow. Great, thank you so much for addressing that. Unfortunately, that is going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'd like to hand it back to you for some closing comments. Yeah, um, I really you know, recommend everyone that has a passion for photography and has a passion for water, you know, give it a chance. It's a very, very rewarding hobby or profession for some. Um, it's, it's really nice when you come back from the trip and, and you have more than, oh, I've seen a beautiful fish and you actually have a picture is a really nice feeling. And, you know, not everyone have access to that. So sharing and bringing out those images, you know, that reality to people, it's really important to help in conservation. So I highly recommend to everyone, you know, give it a shot. Very rewarding hobby. Fernando, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you are interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, give us a call at the number on your screen, or you could send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us Monday for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out next week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon.
With that, I will conclude today's webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.